we were so delighted to get this collective invitation to talk today at the much beloved International Festival of Arts and Ideas, such an important partner of the Yale University Art Gallery, and um, to be challenged by such uh, an ambitious topic. Who, who would have thought that uh, anybody could be asked to speak to the next 20 years of arts and culture <laughs> for the city of New Haven? Um, but truly, I think there's no topic that the three of us would rather talk about than this. The um, only way to think about the arts in New Haven is as the heart of this place. It is so important to who we are as a community and to how we come together as a community. Um, it's an impossible topic to grapple with. Nobody can predict the future. But when I thought a little bit about this topic, I realized I was going to be sitting between two artists and as a curator, and as an art historian, and as a person, there are no people in this world that I've learned more from than the artists that I'm closest with. Uh, creative thinkers who are truly generative uh, as th they think about the future, as they think about what's possible, um, how to actually make something happen, how to make meaning in our lives. You can't learn these things from people any better than you can from artists. And for me personally, these two artists are people that I've learned more from um, really than almost anybody I can think of. So I thought I'd start this conversation by asking the two of you, Titus and Jock, to talk about how your approach and your vision, your practice as artists have shaped your engagement with the city and with this institution of the gallery, how um, the sort of artistic sensibility that you bring to a cultural institution and to um, civic engagement and to your project uh, Next Haven Postmasters in process um, as a way of kicking off this conversation. I don't know, Titus, maybe you'll start because... Um, You've got a project literally in progress as we go. I was hoping I was going to get out of that. Um, uh, I can't talk about 20 years from now, but I'm going to talk about what I think I hope to see in the future here in New Haven. I left New York um, almost 10 years ago now after graduating from Yale. And as I've said before, everybody told me, all my artist friends anyway told me that my career was over if I left New York, because um, of course that's the Mecca. It's the only place where you can make art, apparently. Um, and when I left and I came here, my lifestyle changed, but in a way that was generative, in a way that felt like this is, this is artistically nourishing, this is spiritually nourishing, this is good for my family. And one of the things that I realized was there is a different kind of community here, a different kind of culture here mm -hmm. than is in New York. And as we develop this Next Haven project, which is an arts incubator in the heart of the Dixwell neighborhood, um, designed by Deborah Burke and also designed, interior design by Ming Cho um, and Associates, it's, I feel very strongly that we're putting together something that the whole country is going to be looking at and going, look at that New Haven. Look, look at what they're doing. And, and my goal, we talked about this morning a little bit, some people see what we're doing and it reminds them of things they've seen in New York. And the first thing they wanna say is, that's kinda like Williamsburg, right? <laughs> and my answer is, dear God, I hope not. <laughs> Count me out if it is. Um, what I want to do here, and what I think the future of art is, and most new things are not actually new, they're just recycled, um, and maybe a new way, is getting back to that space where artists work in collaboration, where one artist helps another artist, the artist who is advanced, apprentices the artist who is not, and helps build that career. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a space with a high level of art production, create a space where that kind of thing can happen, where artists can engage with one another. The other thing that I think is really important, particularly in this time, in this moment, is I think what needs to happen and what artists have always done, always done, is speak to their time. We mm -hmm. are living in a very, very challenging time for a number of different reasons that I'm not gonna go into because I'll get really upset and start yelling and screaming, so I'm gonna let that go <laughs> and just say we live in challenging times. And what, I've, what has been encouraging for me is that 
my generation of artists, the generation behind me, are willing to take that head on. They're making work that speaks to this moment, that speaks to this time. And so when I think about the next 20 years, the future, I don't think about it as being so different. I feel like, I feel like the generation before me really laid a great foundation really, really laid a great foundation, and we have the opportunity to build on top of that foundation. Mm -hmm. But I, I, as I said, I do think this idea about collaboration and speaking to this moment will continue on. It's not new. Mm -hmm. mm. I talk a lot about how um, one of the great things to be part of here at the Yale University Art Gallery over the last 16 years on and off that I've been here, um, the last 14 years continuously, is how your directorship talk has really brought artists to the center of everything that we do. And mm -hmm. Titus, you're here at the gallery all the time. You've studied the collection all along. Um, we do this through visiting artists, artists in residence, through um, lots of different conversations that happen. But I wonder if you could speak a little bit to your sensibility as an artist and how the kind of incredible um, institution that you've built uh, and built on, for sure, over the last 20 years mm -hmm. has um, created a platform that will continue 20 years mm -hmm. forward and long beyond that. Mm -hmm. Well, I would, I'd like to begin by saying that there's probably no other Ivy League college or university that would ever have hired me or my great friend Richard Benson mm -hmm. than President Levin of Yale. And I say that because most people don't realize Yale is the only one of the Ivy Leagues that has a school of art, a school of music, a school of drama, in addition to architecture and art history. This is the one Ivy League place in which the makers of art, music, and drama are welcome and thought of as, as true citizens of this place. So when Rick Levin hired Rick Chip Benson, who was a, by then a MacArthur fellow who dropped out of Brown University his freshman year to, to go in the Navy and doesn't even have a college degree, and then hired me, someone who had started an alternative art space in San Francisco in 1974 as a young professor. He was taking a real chance in some respects, but not really when you think of the history of Yale that was started by a living artist, John Trumbull, way back in 1832. And frankly, the thing that was most important for both Richard and I as friends to do when Rick Levin invited us to come and start with this master planning of the Yale Arts area, which he started in 1995, I came in 98, was that you had to learn something about the history. I mean, to go forward, you have to know where you've been. Mm -hmm. So it was really important to understand the history of this, new, this unique University Art Museum that was founded back in 1832. And the only orientation I got at the time from Rick Levin over a little breakfast, he said, you've got to go over there. You've got to make the art historians and the art school people quit fighting with each other. I want you to renovate these three buildings, which, by the way, have 256 years of deferred maintenance on them. And, and, and you have to do it without ever closing for a single day, nor can any of the schools close as they need to renovate. And you all, you leaders, figure out how to do it together. And, and I will support you. If you do this. <laughs> and by God, he really did, as did his wonderful wife, Jane uh, Levin, who teaches the directed studies and used to bring us 400 students freshmen every year. So, you know, when you talk about my leadership, don't forget that Rick Levin was a visionary uh, president of Yale, and, and there's nothing you do either as a director of museum or as a, a president than to hire the right people. So maybe I was a good hire, but I'm sitting next to another great hire. You want to continue this sense of mentoring people, giving them opportunities, and boy, have I had the chance to do that here. So, you know, a lot of what we've done here is really, as Titus said, you know, there's not a lot of stuff that's been invented new. You go back, you study history, you think of what's been done well, or there are examples of things, and then you grow it. And I think uh, <laughs> the one comical thing where I was worried when I first took the job, I was up on the fourth floor of the, of the con building, sitting there on a on a day when it started to rain in the spring and the staff, senior staff is listening to me talk and pretty soon they started to get up and leave and I thought, well, what am I saying that's so wrong or obnoxious? Turned out they were out on the fourth floor and they were bringing in buckets and, and <laughs> barrels to catch all the leaks of the fourth floor con room and they were taking all the Japanese screens off you and so it was really clear where we needed to start. We had to <laughs> 
we had, we had, to, we had to fix the con building. And, and the nice thing is all of us had to cooperate. You know, we're, we're talking about a, a community that's learning more and more how to collaborate and cooperate as we do in this wonderful festival. It's a great example of that, where we share ideas and, and, uh, and, and, and celebrate them together. But we had to figure out how to do this without ever closing anything for days. So that involved who was going to take which swing space, who was going to, where are you going to move people in collections? And you had to put together a team of people who wanted to work together and to work together, frankly, as joyfully as possible. I think we've had a great deal of pleasure even in some of the challenges we've faced. And, you know, I think Titus, you know, you and I, when you're in the studio and you're really making something interesting, you're happy. I mean, you know, you're just striving for something and when it's clicking, you're just, boy, those days don't get any sweeter. And frankly, we've had some really sweet days and months and years here doing what I think all of you have come to appreciate in this community. And it's been really interesting that Rick Levin's other challenge was that I want you to make this collection much more accessible to the commu broader community of, of New Haven. And I want much more engagement with uh, public education, service to young people. We need to bring our neighborhoods more together. You may remember the Yale uh, this benefit they have for Yale people to buy and secure housing with subsidies in different neighborhoods to stabilize our communities so people aren't fleeing to the suburbs. Well, now here we are 20 years later, they are building thousands of apartments downtown New Haven. People are flocking into this city to live in a city where you can have free access to some of the greatest collections here and at the British Art Center and the Peabody. You can have some of the greatest music concerts. You've got the festival, you've got Yale Rep. Uh, there are a lot of very interesting people retiring in New Haven, and frankly, you've got good health care as you get to be my age. You, know, <laughs> you start to think about that, too. And, and uh, so, you know, my sense is of the last 20 years is there's been a tremendous concerted sense not only to work well within the Yale group to pull off things together, but we've really done a lot of outreach to to uh, expand educational opportunities for children and, and families and kids of all ages. And a big part of that was to give more trust to our own students, to have them become gallery guides, to have them become gallery teachers, to let, have Pam take the lead in having these major student curated exhibitions uh, you know, mounted here, that some, all of which have got just as good of reviews as anything that's ever mentioned about me in the New York Times, to tell you the truth. That's how good the shows have been. Mm. So a lot of trust has gone behind, I think, the things that we value here. We trust in people to do the right thing, set up the right culture, the right values, and, and do the work. So we're going to um, dive into a lot of the topics that Jock just mentioned, but I thought it would be interesting, given the fact that the three of us have chosen to live and work and make our homes in New Haven, to think a little bit about our first impressions when we arrived and perhaps how things have changed. Jock, you've been here 20 years now mm -hmm. living right in the city. I've been here. I was here 16 years ago for two years, and then I've been back for um, some number of years since then. You've been here for 14 years. So we all have mm -hmm. you know, a pretty long experience mm -hmm. here now. Do you want to talk about some of your first impressions? Well, again, when I first came here 20 years ago, I remember a number of people said, well, where are you going to live? And I said, well, I'm going to live in New Haven. They said, you're going to live in New Haven? <laughs> and I said, well, well, why does that surprise you? Well, I said, well, you know, New Haven, it's a dangerous place. And I said, are you, are you serious? And they said, yeah. And, and, you know, I said, well, what's that all about? You know, it took me a little while to suss out the pump. Some people were saying, this is a dangerous city. There are black neighborhoods, and these kids are going to come in and mug you. And I started to hear this. Stuff. I said, what in the world is this all about? This is something we've got to start addressing. We all know we're talking about the things mm -hmm. that matter in this society. This, this, this is a great immigrant city with populations that have come from different ethnicity. And there was a certain sense of fear that I, that I heard in the, in the community where I first came that made me upset. I noticed that even going to residential colleges, you couldn't just walk into them anymore. Every college, university I went to, you could walk into any quad. They had to have an electronic pass to get in. So I thought, well, what do you, you, know, what do, you do to make a place or welcoming when there's a certain sense of cultural or racial fear or misunderstanding. Now, let's face it, that's something we still need to do a lot of work on, and it's something that many of us in this room are addressing in the work we do. So I've had that sense when I first came mm -hmm. here. There was some serious work to do that was more than just about art in the mm -hmm. museum or showing art that, that had to do with another kind of education, another kind of collegial work that needed to be done, cultural 
for mm-hmm. it. And I think, you know, Titus, you know, when I, the, I happened to go into the, this guy came in the, he started in 2004, he drew the, he drew the number one ticket to, to pick the studio. He got number one choice, and I happened to, I go over and I, I see him, he's in number one studio, and he gets the tag, it says number one, and it says, you belong here on the tag. <laughs> and I'm not so sure he felt comfortable arriving here, knowing his background as I do. Did he feel he really belonged here? No. So what changed your mind? No. Um, I remember walking through the Roman and Greek sculpture area when I first got here. And, I mean, those of you who know me know that I, my, my academic career was really, really bad. Um, as I always say, my high school GPA was decimal point six five. <laughs> um, and I... Um, I got here after working really hard, after being rejected from Yale three times, I got here and I walked through that hall and my first thought was, you don't belong here. This place is not for you. Mm. I'd never been in a space like that in my entire life. It was far too grand for the Michigan boy that I am. It just didn't make any sense for me that I was there. Mm. And I, I, what Jock is talking about is the, the art school they give you your studios, assign you your studios by picking a, n- a number out of a hat. And I happened to get the first pick. And the first thing that it said on that was, you belong here. And I took that and I put it above my door in the studio. And it's been above every single door in the studio I've ever, I've ever had since then. And what made me feel like maybe I do belong here, it wasn't that tag, but what made me feel like I do belong here was you coming into the studio and insisting that I come back over there mm-hmm. <laughs> to see some, some drawings of things that I had been working on. I never experienced a collection like that before. The neighborhood I grew up in didn't have museums. And when you came over and you said, I see you're working on this Trumbull drawing, you know, we have the original across the street. <laughs> I said, you need to come over here, like, now. <laughs> and just this kind of, between the both of you, this kind of uh, ushering in and saying, yeah, come on in, come on yeah. in. And so now, I mean, there are a few guards at this museum that don't know me by name or my children. We were joking about it before. If I show up at this museum without my two sons, people are generally like, where are your kids? <laughs> <laughs> and it's just this... It does feel comfortable. I do feel like I belong here, that this mm-hmm. is a place. This is yeah. definitely a place for me. But yeah. when I got here, I didn't feel that way. And I know that there are many folks in our community who don't feel that yeah. way. And I think we have a real m- challenge in terms of the yeah. kind of marketing and outreach we mm-hmm. do mm-hmm. to those mm-hmm. kinds of communities here. New Haven mm-hmm. is an amazing place. That's why I'm here. I love it. Yeah. But we have a lot of, we have yeah. a lot of economic disparity in yeah. this community. Yes. We have a lot of educational disparity in this community. Mm-hmm. And if we don't meet it head on, we're, we are going to regret it. Yeah. yeah. I think that's such an, important, such an important point. When I came here right after graduate school as a fellow, um, I was intending to be here for two years. It was a two-year fellowship. I felt incredibly fortunate to get it. I had lived throughout my life up until that point in all kinds of scary neighborhoods and um, you know, trying to uh, make my way through various academic opportunities. And so when people said to me, oh, New Haven, watch out, I was frankly not at all fearful. I think it can't be um, more scary than a lot of the places that I lived in. I didn't find it particularly scary. I did find it um, an incredible place for, of course, intellectual um, activity and the arts. But I moved here thinking I was going to commute from New York. I was living in Brooklyn, uh, and I came here for the fellowship, and I thought, well, I'll be back in New York every weekend because that's where the action is, and that's where the most exciting artists are. And you know, almost you know, within weeks of arriving for this fellowship, it was clear that there was so much important artistic activity happening here, so much to talk about, such a community, that I shifted my frame of reference almost immediately and really based myself here and immersed myself for the two full years. And then, of course, moved away to uh, move on to the next opportunity, as one does after a fellowship, and only later considered coming back. And in the interim period, my husband and I had a baby, and so we were now a family with a child. And in considering coming back, I was not drawn to the artistic and intellectual community for sure, but I also had enough of an inkling 
of what a great place this is for families and what opportunities there are in the arts and probably in other arenas that I hadn't explored yet, like sports, which have become very important to us as a family, um, as a great place to live. And I think that that has borne out over the last 14 years that I've been here as my son has grown up through neighborhood music school, through language instruction at Otoa Palm, through great schools that he's been in, through his activity at the gallery, his engagement with the arts and also with sports, which are his his true love, has been incredible here. Um, so maybe we should talk a little bit about families and children growing up here. One of my great hopes and something that I think does actually bear out is that children who grow up here will think of the Yale University Art Gallery as one of the very great things about growing up here when they remember growing up here. And I know that's true for your kids. I know it's true yeah, for my son. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, one thing, again, you always have to remember in a, in a place like Yale is that most people think this is a place that where they don't belong or don't, you know, maybe aren't welcome. You can never say enough every single day that this place is free and even more important that you're welcome. People, you can never say that enough because people walk by or people who've never been here don't really know they're welcome unless it starts to really be a part of the culture that the word gets around. Now, you know, we were talking this morning, you know, the... When we reopened, one of the things that was really helped us in that regard is many, many of our guards live throughout the city in broader neighborhoods that necessarily are the downtown or in East Rock. And they started to put out the word that, you know, yes, families are really welcome. You should come to these these uh, family weekend days. You should, your kids should come to more of the schools. Some of these people have been working heavy in corrections. You know, to be a guard in a prison is very different than being a guard at the Yale Art Gallery. <laughs> and, and so... You know, you can, and, and, and our guards, you know, frankly, I find it very important to spend time with them because I tell them, you're, you and the people at the front desk are the first people who are seen. It's your sense of hospitality and friendliness that also is, the, you're the ambassadors to this place. You custodians, you keep this place so spotless. You don't see any dust bunnies at the LR Yard. Go, go, go look around. Go to New York and look around. Uh, and then the fact that we're free, don't forget that people can come in here and just for five minutes, someone came to me today and said, I just come over and I come over for five minutes to look at something every week. And and you don't feel the pressure you're trying to get your $25 worth. Mm -hmm. And don't forget, museums have drifted away from the traditions of the free public libraries in America. And $25 you, so you might spend uh, in New York, I think we ought to take out an ad that says, if senior citizens, it's $23.50 round trip to New, from New York to New Haven. Come up here and you'll have a buck fifty less for coffee. <laughs> 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 and, and, and going, and some things, you know, along the way, you just find th ways to tweak things a little to keep making welcoming more a possibility. We went to a free membership program entirely based on uh, what public radio is. None of us have to pay to turn on our radio sets, right? So as long as we have a free membership program, why not? Let's just do away with any of this idea that you have to pay to be a member and just send a couple of soft letters. Well, you know what? The membership went up 50, the, rep, the annual funding went up 50% after we did that. And a lot of that is because, you know, and I sign letters from $5 to $10,000 in that solicitation that come in every year. And a lot of people that are giving more money are giving it because they don't want this country divided economically amongst people any more than we're already suffering from. This is some of the worst. <laughs> Some of the, the worst aspects of our politics is not just the racial division that's being played out, but the economic division. And we can all afford to be more generous in, in, throughout our country. But one of the things that's going to make this, this community even greater in the years to come, in the 20 years, is if we all become a little more philanthropic, whether it's to Music Haven, whether it's to the fantastic New Haven Promise uh, program that I think Pat Melton may be here in the audience who runs it. We now have 10 New Haven Promise students working here every summer, you know, giving kids that, from New Haven real jobs, you know, that aren't just to the fast food place to think about careers where they can stay in New Haven and do meaningful work. You know, when any of us who've had great educations, and the room is full of such, we've had great teachers who mentored for us. And if that continues to happen at whatever level you hit it in your life, it makes a difference. 
And, I, and you and I, you know, the three of us have talked about that. I mean, my teachers just so shaped my life, and you, you want to give back in the way they did. Yeah. And you're an example of it, Titus. You pester me all the time. Why did you guys do it this way and that way? <laughs> we never want to tell you what to do, but he's so curious about how to improve a community and work with the artists of his generation. And that's what you hope for, is that the next generation will pick up some sense of drive and value and curiosity because none of us are here forever. So the best thing you do is pass on the sense of value, energy, and possibility to others. Yeah. And boy, you, two of you are just two of my favorite favorites, as you know. I was just going to say, you know, I think about, I think about, I never expected to be where I am in my career. I, I, I did not expect that. Like, if you know my past, you know my background, nobody would have bet on me but it was those professors who did, yeah. those older artists who said, this guy needs some help, and pulled me aside and yeah. invested in me. The artists mm -hmm. who came before, who I never sat down with, but were influential to me per year, Carrie James Marshall, Carrie Mae Weems, these folks, mm -hmm. they made it possible. And most of those folks taught. Most mm -hmm. of those folks went Absolutely. back, especially the ones that came from the Bay Area. Yeah. Like most of those folks yeah. ta taught. And I've been recognizing that in recent years, my, my generation is becoming extremely mm -hmm. successful in a way that is paved for us by the generation before. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure that even in that success, we make space to mentor, yeah. to find some kind of way. And it's always difficult to balance that career, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. making work in the studio and trying mm -hmm. to like mm -hmm. mentor students and mm -hmm. things like this. But I think we got to do it. Yeah. If, if there is any real reason I'm here, it's because of the mentorship that I received mm -hmm. in the places that I did. Yeah. I'm just gonna, uh, this conversation calls to mind um, one of the programs that I find most inspiring here, and that is that we bring Yale students in to teach our K-12 school groups. And the Yale students come from all different disciplines. They have different backgrounds in teaching. They have um, more or less background in the history of art. They go through an intensive training in both the collection and in the curricular um, needs of the different grade levels. And then they teach 10 hours a week for the entire time that they're graduate students, which could be a couple of years if they're in the School of Art, um, or it could be a longer period if they're in a PhD program. and. A couple things happen. One, they teach 10 hours a week and they become incredibly practiced teachers and they really dive deeply into the content that's needed for the specific classes with the teachers and develop sessions that are right on point for the class. But another thing that happens is you see the school kids look to the student who oftentimes isn't that much older than they are, who's teaching their session here at the gallery, and get a very personal, um, very immediate sense of what it is to be a university student in a way that they might not have that many other examples of. And so it works on all these different levels. There's a study that was very influential to me early on in my career about uh, when people become lifelong museum visitors. And there's a couple of moments. There's early experiences with a family or with some transformative visit through schools. So, you know, er early-ish grade school level activities. And then as a university student, and so with these programs where we have the university students teaching the school kids, we're sort of bringing those moments together mm -hmm. and, and amplifying the effects in a way that's um, a little hard to describe, but when you witness it in the galleries, you really see it happening. You see mm -hmm. there's something clicking. Oh, this, this might be what it would look like if I were to go to college, which mm -hmm. just might be you know yeah. five, 10 years off. Yeah. Well, something else that I think we've really tried to pioneer more in the way we educate and teach in front of actual artworks is, again, to have been hired. Pam as the first curator of academic affairs to not only to develop some of these uh, ways of teaching along with John Walsh. I know many of you have been in this auditorium to hear his fabulous lectures, and he volunteered himself to work with these same endowed gallery teachers. Uh, but, you know, we really thought something else we needed to do was slow people down in front of works. Spend a lot of time with one. Don't just, you know, look at it for two or three seconds and move on. So one of the things we've 
really done. And when you think about it, students to get into a place like Yale, they have to work like crazy to get those high verbal and math scores, but no one's ever given them an SAT on visual. <laughs> right? I ask them, they well, no, no, Mr. Reynolds, there wasn't a <laughs> test for that. I said, that's right. But you have a chance here in this museum to really slow down and study these amazing things. And these people don't create them in four or six seconds. So, you know, spend some time in front of them. So the other thing that's really important, and I think when this, this notion of teaching is rather, you don't want to just lecture people about art. You want them to sit there together in groups and talk about what they're actually seeing. And as they see together, they start to put things together and it creates a conversation at the very end of which it's maybe more interesting to give them some of the real historical data and other stuff. But don't just squash the whole experience by throwing that in at the beginning. That's something I think that we've been doing that I'm really proud of that so many of you have been involved with in, in art, and it's true. Some of our staff who's out there right now, our educators and programmers have really mm -hmm. carried that forward. Many of you have accompanied you know, some of these, these programs where you get to slow down with something. These kids are moving so fast with these cell phones and the checking in with this and that. They're, you know, you might even notice, I put up a little carved sign that says, look, learn, and what's the last word? Linger. linger. Look, learn, and linger. And the linger is really important. Spend the time, you know, with something. And, and, you, know, and, and you know, Titus, you know, when you started to come in here, I w it was so impressive because you were lingering a lot. <laughs> <laughs> or loitering. <laughs> and, and you now do it with your children. Yeah. Now, yeah, what he can. doesn't tell you is the, the reason he's really successful is he wanted to marry the most fabulous woman in the world. And that's she absolutely and true. And she insisted that he get an education and get himself together. And also, that's absolutely. That's true. really, that was his first great move. That was, awesome. I married up for sure. I married over my head, too. <laughs> we all did. <laughs> I was just going to say one of the coolest things was being in the gallery and I was just, I was just hanging out, and I was with my kids, and we were drawing the Kerry James Marshall painting. And a group of students walked over and stood in front of my painting. And my son, Davin, he's like, "Dad, they're looking at your painting." I was like, "Yeah, I, I know. Let's continue drawing." He's like, "I want to tell them it's your painting." I'm like, no, no, don't, don't do that. Just let them, let them enjoy looking at the painting. Come on, Dad, please, 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 no. And and right as he said it, there was a kid who was responding to one of the teachers who was asking the question, and the kid goes something like. I just don't know why he put nails in George Washington's face. That I don't understand. And I was like, okay, let's go now. <laughs> well, Pam, you know, you and I have been very involved in our Artists in Residence program. And, and, and one of the other things that's been really wonderful is to bring in, not only support the artists working here and studying here, but to bring really interesting artists like Carrie James Marshall mm -hmm. and many others in here to to you know, to acquire their work, to let them do original research of their own without any sense that they have to produce some product. But we look at the chance to support them in an interesting moment in their creative life and then try to find something to do with them or yeah. some major work to purchase. And, and when you treat artists well, particularly given those kinds of opportunities, boy, it sure, it comes back to the institution in, in wonderful ways. And, and, uh, and that's certainly the truth of Kerry James Marshall, where I had that wonderful experience of working with him at Andover and at Yale. And, and uh, you know, that great painting that's upstairs, I, I should tell you this. Can I tell a quick little story? Tell about that it? story. Well, so, so we, we were bidding the night before I went to his studio in Chicago. I had a backup plane trip at 6 a.m. in the morning to go to Chicago. There was a painting called Our Town of his that was up at auction mm -hmm. at Christie's. And I really wanted to buy it for Yale. And I'd, I'd gotten, I thought, a pretty hefty war chest to, together of $600,000. And, and I thought I'd, we might be able to snag the painting for that. And the bidding going with the bidding going, just blew right past the 600000 I'm going, oh, God, I'm so glad I've got that plane ticket. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out Alice Watt all bought the painting. <laughs> there was no way we were ever would have gotten that painting. <laughs> well, having worked twice with Kerry at, at, at Andover and Yale, he said, Jock, you, if you don't get the painting, you come to my studio. There's a whole body of new work, and you can have first pick of anything in the studio. And we ended up with buying that painting for less than half of what I was prepared to, to bid for the other. And he gave us three drawings on top, and he's come and done you know, he's done studio visits and encouraged people like Titus and Angedeca. You know, 
really wonderful artists are often helpful to other artists. It's what you were talking about before, or grateful for the opportunities they've had. And they want to help. They want their best work to go to museums. You've that's got right. some of you, you know, that's where we fired a couple of your greatest paintings are now here. They're not going anywhere. Well, loan them, but they're, they're here. <laughs> Two, two wonderful paintings by Titus on the third floor in our Benenson Galleries, um, Shadows of Liberty and Another Fight for Remembrance. So I know you've all visited them, but please do go upstairs and visit them again. And, and one other point about Kerry James Marshall's residency a few years ago, his... Um, as Jock says, these residencies are very open-ended and there's not uh, a specific outcome that we expect or, or requirements of the residency. And he really uh, took on a research project looking into, guess what, the papers of Eero Saarinen and thinking about how the architectural imagination might help um, us think about a better future more generally. So this goes directly to the yeah. topic of this panel. You know, the idea of the um, artist's imagination as something that can be really generative for a better future for all of us. And on that, I, I'd love for us to talk a little bit about the Yale University Art Gallery, Next Haven Postmasters collaboration with artists in residence going forward and our hopes to bring those programs closer together as we, as we move into the future. Yeah. So what's under construction? What's happening? <laughs> so how many how many of you guys live in New Haven? Oh, okay. Few. All right. Um, you guys get to the Dixwell neighborhood now and then, I'm assuming, down to Dixwell Avenue. Um, well, if you turn off on Henry Street, um, headed towards Hill House High School, uh, there is the old McAllister Becknell building. You guys don't know that building. Um, and it had been kind of, uh, well, it's a long story, but let's just say it wasn't taken care of. It wasn't loved. And... Our organization bought that building and has been working to renovate that building, as I said, um, with an um, uh, amazing team of people, uh, 40,000 square feet to bring something pretty special here, as I said before. But one of the coolest parts of the program that we're developing is this artist in residency program. Through this institution, amazing artists, world-class artists have come through New Haven. And we want to give them, number one, a place to work if they like, a community to be in, and a good cup of coffee. And that's <laughs> essentially what we're doing. So we have four residency spaces in the building. Um, the largest one is 2,000 square feet, which we actually call the Carrie James Marshall Wing. Um, and it is a live-work space with you know, a separate kitchen and bathroom. And it has an 800 square foot terrace where you can see West Rock over there. Um, we, are, we, are, we are trying to say uh, to the rest of my art community. There's more here in New Haven than, than you thought. Um, and we believe that if we, if we do this work at, at a really high level, um, the, the value proposition is pretty obvious. You know, when I, when I graduated from Yale, almost everybody I graduated with said, peace out, I'm gone, New Haven, and they left. This year, I talked to about six graduate students of the... 20 or 12 of mm -hmm. that year and about half of them were like, you know, I think I'm thinking I'm staying in New yeah. Haven mm -hmm. And part of that is because <clears throat> New Haven is evolving away But let's be honest New York has become so expensive right now that it is forcing the artists out Yeah, now look <clears throat> New York has these amazing institutions, which we will continue to exhibit in if MoMA calls me I'm doing a show <laughs> <laughs> but, but I believe very strongly that New Haven could be the place to incubate those artists, the place where artists come and they know that they have space, they have time, they yeah. have community to make that work. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's essentially what we're trying to do with this space. Yeah. Let folks know that New Haven has a place for you. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. 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 You know. When we, when we talk about the challenges of your generation and, and millennials and, and what we faced in the 60s and 70s, the first boomers coming out with MFAs is, you know, going into L.A., Chicago, New York, south of Market, Soho, real estate was dirt cheap. Yeah. We were talking about this this morning, the, the kind of prices you're paying for a great building in New Haven is what we paid for a great building south of Market Street, which now you couldn't even begin to put even no. a down payment near one of them. No. So there is a funny way in which New York is somewhat in danger of killing the golden goose the way Paris started to lose the core of its arts community. 
because no mm. one could afford to live there except super successful artists or yeah. kids who were on trust funds. And, and the, the, the artist community is always going to be more diverse than that. Yeah. And so they're going to seek out. And what we have, we're so close to New York, we get the greatest benefit from it. But there is so much still reasonable real estate, as you've found, to develop places to work. It's a great city to live in. It's easy to get around. There are all these fantastic amenities. Um, I think it's it's just it's it's an amazing promise here what we have it's it's really other than the Smithsonian there's there's no place that has that much free art mm. coming at you all the time and one other thing it's important because I just came from a conference of university and college museums university and college museums are frankly amongst the only museums that generally are free in America Think about that. So if you're, if you're tr creating that culture and strengthening it here and you're training new generations that know the value of that, when they get these fancy jobs and move up the, uh, you know, the food chain into some of this, they're going to they're gonna bring some of those values with them and they're going to put some stress on this to change some of this, this stuff that isn't so healthy in the art world right now. And I think New Haven is perfectly positioned to be a leading institution in that regard. And it's also interesting when you think about it, look what's happening in Detroit where the DIA almost went under, but was wonderfully saved. And now many, many artists have moved back to where you're from and bought these houses and places very cheap, but they've got one of the greatest museums in America as a, as a source. Yeah. So, you know, there are certain communities in this country, New Haven being, I think, an exemplar of that, where you're close to greatness, but you, can, you create another kind of greatness in yeah. the community we have here. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think another part of um, thinking about how to continue this momentum and yeah. continue this um, culture and build on, build on the, the base that we've all worked on so hard together is to think about collaboration. And for a small city, there is an incredible concentration of arts organizations and art schools at the university that can work together. Yeah. And so much of, um, I mean, this is what we're doing with the Artists in Residence program, the idea of joining forces and being able to um, sort of build on the Artists in Residency program that we've had at the gallery now to be able to offer more of a community, to offer a studio space, which we've never had before. We've got great research resources, but we've never had a studio space. Um, that's an incredible opportunity, and there's so many more. Yeah. Well, there are also a lot more students volunteering, you know, not just mm -hmm. Yale students, but things like, you know, Music Haven is, is wonderful. All these kids that are getting taught, you know, instruments and are giving concerts throughout the students. You know, you, these, these students who feel that that's an important part of their university education often devote... You know, I know a lot of them, for example, who were great athletes who dropped out of varsity sports because they wanted something more diverse in their college education. They said, I played varsity baseball for two years, now I want to be a presidential fellow or I want to be a gallery teacher or something else. Uh, so, you know, a Yale education offers students a sense of volunteerism for service that I think is wonderful. But that's true of a lot of things in our community. Mm -hmm. And the more those interactions occur between these, these kinds of institutions, the healthier the place will be. And I'm, I'm, I hope all of you in the audience are as bullish as, as the three of us are. I, I do think the next 20 years here are gonna be really, really very <coughs> promising. But I do think that there needs to be a greater sense of philanthropy. We've, we all need to, put, who can, need to put a little more money behind the things we care about. This is, this is you know, and. This is something we need to, this, we, not, everyone needs to think about that a little bit because there are a lot of places that are struggling more than they should be. Mm -hmm. And I say that not saying, you know, places need to be managed well to enjoy your donations and your support, but if they are, boy, they deserve to be supported. And didn't, when whoever introduced us said, there, what do we have, 80 nonprofits in the arts already going in this city? So uh, if there's some that you particularly like, you know, think about, getting a little more behind them. The Yale University Art Gallery, frankly, is in pretty darn good shape. You know, and, and a lot of that has to do with many of you who've contributed to it, and David Swenson's managed our endowment beautifully, so this place is never going to be in jeopardy of, you know, not coming to a full, long life. But there are worthy things in our community that need more support to, to grow and, and survive out of foundership or out of at the adolescence of, a, of, a, of an, an organization. And not all are meant to live forever, but some should frankly endure. I mean, I, I don't want to pick favorites here, but there's some really great institutions in this town. 
Well, and the possibility of working across the arts. I think Music Haven is such a great example. We have a regular series um, of concerts with um, close looking at art and the performances Mm -hmm. are related to the art. And we've had collaborations with so many other music organizations as well um, through the Jazz Lives exhibition and the performances that Neighborhood Music School sponsored. And then the Morse Music Academy through the School of Music has sessions here every summer. So the bringing together of art and music is just one example of cross-disciplinary arts possibilities that have been very rich here. Um, So that's a a really, you know, another way of thinking about how we support each other. Mm -hmm. I do want to let us get to the reception, but just something clicked when you were talking about um, sometimes feeling like you're being too uh, honest or, or sort of a little close to the bone as an artist. And it goes back to what I very first said about this panel. And maybe it's just a thought for us all to leave on. When I was talking about the vision of both of you as artists in building this institution and in building a, a robust arts community in this city, um, you know, it's different every day and it's different with every move, but the thing that's consistent in my work with both of you and has never, ever wavered and has always been so impressive to me is how genuine you are. There is never a question of honesty and genuineness. And that is a rare thing in a kind of working practice where you have to be practical. The genuineness is really critical. And somehow I think that comes through. When you talk about people connecting because of the honesty of the work or because of the honesty of the work of this institution, that is not to be overlooked. People do connect when they see something true and real and and genuine Mm. in front of them. And I think it's something that we can all continue to strive for. Um, that I hope will characterize the next 20 years and, and forever. Yeah, so keep, keep it real. Yeah. Thank you. There's food and drink out here for you, lots of it. Good to see you. We have a three-way here. It's not. It's not.